Today we celebrate Jesus as the Lord of all of existence, the Lord of everything. And there's a tremendous irony in this gospel because as Jesus stands there before Pontius Pilate, he completely misses it. He expects Jesus is just some sort of political leader, some civil ruler. And Jesus points out that his kingdom does not belong to this world. He's not limited to some merely earthly kingdom, but his kingdom encompasses all of existence itself. In our first reading from the prophet Daniel, this was from centuries before the time of Christ. The prophet Daniel uses this title, the Son of Man. In the Old Testament, this was usually used in reference to a human figure. It was used elsewhere, also in Ezekiel and in the Psalms and a few places. So he's using this title for a human figure, the Son of Man coming. But then he says, on the clouds of heaven. So clearly a divine figure as well. And it's in this prophecy and others from the book of Daniel that led to the expectation at the time of Christ that the Messiah would come. And as you may recall, when Jesus was brought before the high priest on trial right before his death, the high priest asked him directly, are you the Messiah, the anointed one of God? And in response, Jesus quotes this prophecy from Daniel. He says, I am. And you will see one like the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tears his garments because he thinks Jesus is committing blasphemy. So Jesus is claiming he is this one, the King of all things, the Lord of the universe. But today I, I really want to focus on some very practical implications of this because it's pretty easy to talk about this to to meditate on these scriptures that speak about this but what does it really look like as Catholics today to acknowledge and live out the kingship of Christ so first of all Jesus is king of my church and this should be a great consolation to us you know in this time of of so much turmoil and, and, and corruption in the church coming out, all of us should take great hope in the fact that at the end of the day, Jesus is the king of this church. We're not followers after any bishop or pope or any priest. We are followers of Jesus Christ. And there will come a day when Jesus will bring out all that has been done wrong, he'll bring light to all these things, and he'll bring about justice in a way that no one else can. So if you're feeling frustrated that there's sort of this endless procession of one corruption and, and betrayal after another, there will come an end to that. One day, at the end of time, when Jesus, his kingship is extended to all of creation once and for all, this will all be set right. But here and now, and on a more local level, if we really mean it when we say that Jesus is king of my church, that means he's king of this parish. And so rather than just simply thinking or asking about what I want to have happen here at St. Pat's, each one of us should always be asking, Lord, what do you want to do here? In fact, every time the leadership team meets, which is about every week, we start off with a time of prayer focused exactly on this. Lord, what are you doing in our parish? What do you want to bring here? Jesus is the king of my country. This also should be something that brings us great hope. It also seems like there's this endless parade of corruption in our politics today. And there's so much division and, and so much turmoil. But remember that at the end of all things, Jesus is going to bring his dominion and power over all political entities. And there will be a day when justice is finally and irrevocably brought about. And we, as faithful citizens, as Catholics, 
should never forget our duty to pray for our politicians. I often say that if we prayed for our politicians as much as we complained about them, we'd be in a much better state today. But something I want to focus on particularly is this strange understanding that I, I often come up against, and it's this, that our faith is set aside when it comes to politics. This is absolutely not the Catholic understanding of how faith and politics work together. And I know where it comes from. I mean, there are lots of different things it comes from, but one of the main things is this pretty ingrained understanding of the separation of church and state. And that's a good thing. That The reason why this came about is, historically, there were lots of problems that would come from governments or kings, especially in the Middle Ages, getting overly involved in church affairs. And it just led to all sorts of problems and corruption and, and people being forced to believe certain things. And so th we began to realize in the westernized, westernized world that there has to be a separation from the church and the state. And it's really to protect the church from excessive influence of the state. The problem is, today, we've sort of flipped that understanding. And most people see that it's the, the government needs to be protected from the evil influence of the church. That's how so many people look at it today. But that is not the historical understanding. We as Catholics are called to use our faith as a guide when it comes to politics, when it comes to voting. The Catechism of the Catholic Church in, in paragraph 2246 says this, Church the church passes moral judgment on matters related to politics. The church has an authority on certain issues, particularly issues that have to do with human rights, because Jesus himself spoke so directly on these issues. The Catechism continues in 2442. It is the duty of the lay faithful. That's all of you. For once... Me and the priests and deacons, we're off the hook for this one. It is the duty of the lay faithful to intervene directly in political structures and social order. And of course, not just to intervene kind of haphazardly, but intervene as Catholics, as Christians, to bring your faith into the political realm, to use your faith as a guide. Jesus is king of my family. How often are the decisions in the family made through prayer? You know, you as mothers and fathers have to make all sorts of decisions at home. Decisions about work, about where you might live or move, decisions about your kids' futures and their school, all sorts of things. And how often do you start by going to the Lord and asking him, Lord, what do you want for my family? What do you want for my son or daughter? And is the routine of the family, family life back home centered on prayer? Family is called the domestic church. It means the family is the most important building block of the church community at large. And if prayer is important for our parish, then certainly it needs to be important at home. But so often, prayer just becomes something on the back burner, something you might get around to if you have time for it. And instead, especially in Brighton, it seems, sports is the center of everything. But as Catholics, family life should be centered on prayer. And if we're not doing that, then certainly the kids are never going to make it a priority. And am I faithful to the teachings of Jesus when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to my relationship with my spouse? Again, there's this attitude I come across sometimes that's quite baffling to me. Some people say the church has no business in the bedroom. But remember that the teaching authority of the church comes from Jesus himself. So that's a little bit like saying, well, that is like saying Jesus has no place in my bedroom. But last time I checked, if, we, if we're really serious about saying Jesus is King and Lord of the universe of all existence, 
And that includes what goes on in the bedroom, doesn't it? So, in family life, in the intimacy of my relationship with my spouse, am I striving to be faithful to the teachings of Jesus and his church? Jesus as king of my life. Every one of us, regardless of what state you're in in life, if you're married or single or older or a widow or whatever, each one of us throughout life is faced with decisions and, and as the journey of life goes on. And in the midst of all of that, are we really taking time to ask the Lord, what do you want me to do in this situation? What do you want me to do with my life? Those are not simply questions for the excessively pious. Those are for all of us. Do I really allow the Spirit to lead me in my life? Today is a beautiful feast. We have lots of beautiful feasts in the liturgical year. Certainly Christmas coming up and after that Easter are some of the, the most important ones. But in a certain sense, you could say that today is the most important of all because it's placed at the end of the liturgical year, at the end of all things, at the end of all that we consider in our faith and in our prayer, Jesus is the Lord and the King of it all. And there's nothing more discouraging, nothing more off-putting than seeing someone who claims to be Catholic, claims to be Christian, but does not live that out in their everyday life. So let's take some time to consider some of these very practical, real ways that we can live out Jesus' kingship in our hearts. Because the more we allow Jesus to rule in our lives as the king of all, the more his dominion will come into this world and the more our world will be ready for the day when he comes again and he extends his power and his dominion over all of existence, for all time. Amen.